I'd like to call this March 30th meeting of the Hampton School Board to order. Ms. Bowers, would you call the roll? Mr. Harper? Here. Ms. Henry? Here. Mr. Kilgore? Here. Mr. Pearson? Mr. Samuels? Present. Ms. Smith? Here. Ms. Muggler? Here. Let the record show that uh, six of our school board members are in attendance for tonight's meeting along with Division Superintendent Dr. Jeffrey Smith, our school board attorney, Ms. Nancy Reeves, and our school board clerk, Ms. Carolyn Bowers, along with our student liaison uh, tonight, our representative, uh, Sierra Lewis. And um, so at this point, I'll turn things over to you, Sierra, to make some introductions. Hi, everyone. We, tonight we have Mr. Elisha Akram, Ak, I'm sorry, I know, hold on. Arokium, did I get it right? Okay, thank you. And he is a fourth grader at Cary Elementary School and he will be given the invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening everybody, will you all, will you all please stand for the pledge for me? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Today I will be reading a poem and it's called The Power of One. The author is unknown. Thank you. One song can spark a moment. One flower can wake the dream. One tree can start a forest. One bird can heal spring. One smile begins a friendship. One hand clasp lifts the soul. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word can frame the goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh will conquer doom. One step must start each journey. One word must start each prayer. One hope will raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make the difference. You see, it's up to you. Thank you. Great job. You have your parents here with you tonight, your dad and your mom, and your sister, and your brother as well. So you guys want to stand and get recognized. Thank you. We also have your principal here. Thank you for being here as well. Um, Elisha is a football and, ba well, he likes to play football and basketball, and he is an honorable student at Cary Elementary. Thank you. Awesome job, Elisha. Um, would you come, come, come back to the microphone for us? Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate your, your invocation, and uh, it was a nice way to start off our meeting. Um, and you delivered it very well. Um, so you're a student at Cary. Yes. And um, you're a fourth grader. Yes. And what's your favorite subject there? Math. Math, okay. Who's your math teacher? Miss LaPointe. Miss LaPointe, well she's doing good work if she's got a fourth grader who loves math. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. We wish you luck with the rest of your school year. And, um, and again, thank you for coming. Thank you, and you're welcome. Awesome. Good night. <laughs> At this time, we have some recognitions, and I'll call on, call on our Executive Director of Public Relations and Marketing, Ms. Diana Galata, and she will be assisted tonight by school board member Mrs. Phyllis Henry. Good 
Good evening. It's our pleasure this evening to recognize Jennifer Brown and Teresa Mishner, the co-founders of the Community Nights Incorporated. Can you all come forward, please? <laughs> Community Nights is committed to identifying the needs of small local nonprofit and public school organizations as well as the population they serve and finding innovative ways to help them meet these needs collaboratively. They are also dedicated to identifying service gaps for underserved populations within our community and through the development of a nonprofit incubator, support and educate startup organizations to fill unmet needs within our community. Within just the past three years, Community Nights has raised and distributed more than $300,000 in community grants. Most of this is raised through Community Nights Bingo. Now listen to this, nearly $90,000 of that has been granted to Phoebus High School. Woo! <laughs> Epping for you. Um, 53,000 of that went to the first robotics team. They've also contributed to the Phoebus track team, Model UN, Anime Club, PHS Culinary Arts, the PTSA, just to name a few. Community Nights is looking to grow its organization and purchase a facility to call home. We are extremely thankful for their support of Hampton City Schools and thank them for any support that they might provide in the future, hint. For that reason, it is our honor to publicly recognize Ms. Brown and Ms. Michener for their dedication and support to our students, our schools, and our community. You get one for each here. Achievement that says congratulating, uh, congratulations from Hampton School Board Jennifer Brown in recognition of Community Nights for their generous support. And there is another one also signed by our superintendent and our, our chairman of the school board to Teresa Michener. And um, ladies, I want you to take a minute, since you're doing all this work for us, come on over here and give your pitch while you're at it. <laughs> because um, these ladies, the, the $300,000 didn't just come from the sky. They had to work for it. And the folks who, who received it had to work for it a little bit too by writing mm -hmm. a grant proposal for why they needed it. So why don't you tell us how we can come help you raise money and how if you needed some money for your school or your nonprofit, you could ask you about it. Certainly. Um, Community Nights is about working collaboratively. So the way, this is our gift program that we're talking about, which is our grant initiative fundraising team, and it is a team. And um, to get a grant, you to be, our qualifications for a grant, first of all, your grant money has to directly benefit the citizens of the Virginia Peninsula. So all the money we raise stays in our community because we're about building the community. All of our public schools pretty much automatically meet that grant criteria. We also need you to use the money in a fiscally responsible way, so we do require after you receive a grant that you give us a grant statement and tell us how you use the money. We don't give you really tight restrictions on how that money is used. Um, just to give the robotics program as an example, other grants they get are very specific that they have to use the money for registration fees, they have to use the money for travel expenses, but they don't think about the fact that those kids stay at school sometimes until midnight during build season. I know this because my daughter did that. And sometimes, yeah, and her son is doing that now. They need to eat when they're there. There's lots of small expenses that come up in these programs that support our children. And nobody takes that into account. And they pretty much are relying on grant funds now to take care of that. So we leave that grant funding very wide open to be used in the way that it's needed. The last criteria that we have is that you participate in fundraising. So we take the volunteer pools of all of these groups and they come and participate. And so we have a participation matrix that goes into also looking at how the grants are distributed. So we look at who's coming out and volunteering, but also the quality of the volunteers, how, that they come on time, that they have a positive attitude and all of that. And they apply quarterly for grants. Okay, so we can look you up and... Um, our website, website? is www.communitynights.org and there you can apply for our grant program online. Okay, and then you can, can, can work and benefit. Yes. Thank you so much Thank for you. all that you do for us. <laughs> 
also would like to acknowledge our two of our board members who are here, which is Gary Hunter and Greta Harrison, which have helped us build this program as well. They're very shy. They're very shy. They won't even sta stand up. Come on. You can stand up. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I know Gary Hunter is not shy. <laughs> He, he, come, he, he came across city lines to visit with us tonight. He's all from Newport News City School Board. Gary, thanks for being with us tonight. And uh, while I'm talking, if I, I don't know if the camera's on me or not, but while I'm talking, I do want to um, congratulate you all on, on your recognition tonight. But I have a long history with uh, Teresa and, um, and with Jennifer, we go way back to the years when we were in the Junior Women's Club together, and we are now uh, too old to be in the Junior Women's Club. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they've been doing great things in the community for a long, long time, and this is just a culmination of their dedication to doing good things for, for others. And so I commend your, your great work. Carry on. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to change gears and show you a video. Let me provide it with a proper introduction. In an effort to expand our efforts to share good news about our schools and our students, PEG TV, in cooperation with the Public Relations Marketing Department and our four high schools, have created the Shining Stars Alumni Series. The purpose of the series is to highlight the accomplishments of our alumni while demonstrating how well our schools prepare students for life after high school. Tonight, we are pleased to share with you the first of many videos highlighting our graduates. Roll video. Hello, my name is Leonard Sledge. I have the privilege of serving as the Director of Economic Development for the City of Hampton, and I am a very proud 1991 graduate of Bethel High School. Going to Bethel was, it was just a great experience in high school, uh, from participating in, in sports and other extracurricular activities, having great teachers, and really having the opportunity as a young man uh, to prepare myself for college and life after college. It was a very sound and good foundation that I got at Bethel High School. This, this work that I have the privilege of doing in the city of Hampton, it is truly a labor of love. Uh, knowing that the work that my team and I here in the Economic Development Department, the work that we do, it does have a tangible impact on the lives of every citizen in the city of Hampton. Uh, I have three children who are in Hampton City Schools. Uh, my daughter is actually graduating from Bethel this year, another proud Bruin. And my personal philosophy is if I can help create opportunities for my own children, then I've helped to create opportunities for other people's children as well. My career aspirations actually became solidified when I was in middle school at Jeff Davis Middle School. And it was, it was during that time there that I, I participated in Chrome. Uh, and I knew I wanted to be an engineer. And I was fortunate enough as a high school student to intern at NASA Langley Research Center. I also participated in the SHARP program there and Chrome and, and other programs and activities. And so I actually went to school and got an engineering degree and worked in advanced manufacturing uh, and, in some other, and in some other areas of manufacturing. And then one day I got the aha moment and figured out what it was I wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, and that was workforce and economic development. And it was, it's been truly a blessing to have the opportunity to, to grow up in my career professionally, to come back home and to have the opportunity to serve the citizens and my friends and family here in the city of Hampton. My name is Kevin Juergen and I'm a 1982 graduate of Kickatan High School. Uh, also went to uh, Francis Hasbury Elementary School and, and Jones Junior High School. I'm the founder and general manager of YLS Incorporated. It's a, it's a full service landscape uh, uh, installation contracting company. And uh, we've been in business, uh, started the company in 1987. Uh, and I actually started it right after college. Uh, went to Christopher Newport, uh, graduated from there in 1986. And, uh, and, and we've grown to where we are today. Essentially, Hampton City School Systems really uh, prepared me for college and, and, and created a solid foundation for life in general. Um, I, had a lot of, I have a lot of fond memories of, of Kickatan. I, I was a tennis player there, and, and uh, one of the uh, people that was very instrumental in, uh, in, my, in my success, I believe, is uh, Coach Mark Vandervoort. And, uh, 
he really uh, pushed all the players to, to their limits and, and uh, really um, instilled a lot of good qualities uh, into us. And, uh, and it's funny, I ran into him in, at a job site uh, about three years ago uh, after 30 some years and, uh, and we actually do work for him today. So we've re sort of reuni re reunited. I joined uh, the Virginia Peninsula Rotary Club uh, in 2002. Felt there was time and, and, a, and, a, and good, it was a good thing to uh, be more involved and to give back to the community. I was president in 2013, 2014, and I'm currently the foundation chair of our club. And, um, and uh, it's, it's ironic because we actually have four uh, 1982 Kickatane graduates that also are members of our club. Uh, and I'm also on the advisory board for the Salvation Army. Well, the community has been so good to me. Uh, it's helped us uh, structure our business because growing up in the community uh, is really, I mean, you've, you build relationships over the course of time and that really helps out as far as uh, being successful. And, uh, and giving back is just the way, it's the, it's the right thing to do. Hi, my name is Christina Parrish. I'm the program director at Girls Inc. of the Washington DC metropolitan area and I am a 2004 Phoebus High School graduate. Um, at Girls Inc. we hope to inspire all girls to be strong, smart, and bold so they become women who are healthy, educated, and independent. And I basically run all the programs that do that um, for our organization. There are a number of reasons that I'm really proud to be um, a part of the legacy of Phoebus High School and Hampton City Schools. One of those is just seeing what my classmates and other alum from Phoebus are doing now. We have teachers, we have people that are getting doctorates, we have people in the financial industry. We're just all over the place doing amazing work, so it makes me really proud to be a part of that group. Um, I also am really proud of the way um, my class and all the students that were at Phoebus when I was there, how they were, it was like a family. So I, I'm really proud to be from a place where you can come from different backgrounds and different neighborhoods, but still come together and be one family. So today I work with a diverse group of people. Um, I work with young people. I work with their parents. I work with the community. I work with schools. I work with the government. I work with private industry. All kinds of different groups come together to support the girls and the programs that we do at Girls Inc. of DC. Um, so being from a place, Hampton Roads, um, going to Phoebus, which pulled a lot of people together from different backgrounds, I feel that it prepared me um, by allowing me to have that experience early on. As a 14-year-old, I was meeting people from all over the city, um, doing amazing different things and from with different kinds of families. And so coming up here and working for this organization, I was able to use that experience of just being comfortable with everyone and really learning how to connect with people beyond um, immediate difference um, that really helped me to do what I'm doing now to be successful at it. Hampton City Schools, there, there's a lot to offer there. there. There's so much in all the schools. I mean, Phoebus, of course, I'm very, um, I'm very much a supporter of Phoebus because I went there, but I think, you know, I have friends from all over Bethel, Kikatan, Hampton, and um, all, everyone's doing great and everyone's doing, you know, well and was I think that being from an area where the school system really supports you and encourages you to try new things and to be a part of a lot of different kinds of clubs and organizations, um, that's really what made people successful um, and still connected today. My name's Christopher Hutton. I'm a judge here in the circuit court for the city of Hampton. That's been my job for 20 years and I'm a 1968 graduate of Hampton High School. The Hampton City Schools High School uh, experience allowed me to meet with a lot of people I had never met with before and listen to a lot of ideas and voices that I hadn't necessarily heard. Those are the things that uh, allow you to progress from being a teenager to an adolescent to an adult. It led me into public service, into government. Uh, some experiences I've had in high school helped me to, to transition and relationships that I had formed there exist to uh, this current day, one of the gentlemen I met in August of 1965, Will Taylor, also happens to be a judge in this building. So our relationship that started while we were at Hampton High School in, indoors and is very special. I became a circuit court judge after having been a prosecutor for 20 years. Uh, being a prosecutor for 20 years gives you a very uh, jaded or difficult uh, perspective on much of the court system because you deal only with criminal justice issues. I was very fortunate to be able to become a circuit judge about 20 years ago, and I've really enjoyed that experience because it's much more diverse in the material that you 
deal with, the types of issues that you deal with. I hope that everybody values their lifetime as a student before high school, during high school. Uh, the things that you learn there prepare you for whatever you're going to do after you leave high school. Take advantage of them, make the most of them, and go on to push the, uh, the frontier of knowledge as you live uh, your whole life. That was awesome. Miss um, Glotta, I mentioned the idea to me, I, I don't know, a number of weeks ago. And um, so I had no idea what the videos were going to look like or, or who was going to be in them. But that was a really special treat to see those folks and, and the successes that um, our alumni are having. So what, what a great treat that was. And do we get to have that every month? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no. <laughs> Okay, we don't want that. We are going to have four. That's just the very beginning. That was awesome. Well, we, and these, uh, these are going to be aired on um, Channel 46? Yes, it will be aired in all the regular places that we air everything, but we wanted to debut it to you. Oh, that's wonderful. Beautiful. Loved it. Anyone else want to comment on that? Well, or, we, all right, we'll carry on. That, that was great. Uh, we move on now to our consent agenda, which uh, consists of one item, Personnel Report 16-08. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kilgore and seconded by Mr. Samuels that we approve tonight's consent agenda. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call the vote? Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Muggler? Aye. Motion carries. This brings us to our superintendent and staff reports. Uh, I'll turn things over to you, Dr. Smith. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, we'll start with um, certainly our partnership with uh, Thomas Nelson Community College, in particular with the uh, dual enrollment uh, program. And um, Dr. Woods will certainly uh, provide information. I think we have also members of um, the team from Thomas Nelson Community College, um, members who are present who will share and participate along with some members of, uh, of our staff here in Hampton City uh, with the schools. And so the real purpose is to share with you, of course, we're building from places of strength um, and to share with you our direction as we move forward uh, and strengthen our dual enrollment program uh, and our partnership with Thomas Nelson Community College. And so I will conclude my remarks at that point and ask Dr. Woods uh, to uh, move forward and, and share with us. Thank you, Dr. Smith, Mrs. Muggler, school board members, and Hampton community. Yes, we have started a journey, and you heard on this spotlight on some of our graduates how important that high school experience is, and we know that. And we, we take the challenge to make sure that we address the big picture that our students will face in the jobs of the emerging market that require a different set of skills than, than some of us had when we were coming out of high school. It often includes post-secondary training and education. And so this year, we initiated a dual enrollment design team. It's very large. Uh, you'll hear some about them tonight. So we have some members of the team here to present on uh, the work that we've been doing. You heard about some of it earlier when we presented some policies to you. And we certainly appreciate your input in those policies so that we could remove some of the barriers that we had relative to dual enrollment. Uh, so this evening, we'll focus on the collaboration with Thomas Nelson, our post-secondary partner. Our presenters will include Sierra Lewis, our student representative, Patrice Williams, the Bethel High School School Counseling Coordinator, Mrs. Jennifer Oliver, Bethel High School College and Career Counselor, Ms. Genevieve Elezier, Kikatan and Phoebus High School College and Career Counselor, Ms. Yasmin Ray, who is a Thomas Nelson early college student. Remember, several years ago, we had early college with Gear Up, and she'd like to share her experience that started in high school. 
Ms. Joan Patterson, a parent from the parent perspective, and we have the Dean of Student Enrollment from Thomas Nelson uh, Community College, Chris Rarick. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sierra. Good afternoon, the board. Good afternoon. I was gonna give you a quick overview of some of the things that the dual enrollment team did, which was the mission of the dual enrollment program, dual credit opportunities for HCS students, benefits of dual enrollment, and propo proposed implementation, sorry. If you were a part of the dual enrollment design team, could you please stand and be recognized? Thank you for all that you all did, thank you. Good evening. I wanna first start off by saying thank you. My daughter had the opportunity to take advantage of the dual enrollment when she was a student at Bethel, so I'm very grateful that we have these programs in place. Dual credit allows our high school students to enroll in college courses for credit prior to graduation. It, Dual enrollment is available through Advanced Placement, Governor School, International Baccalaureate Program, and dual enrollment. In the 2016 school year, we will implement dual enrollment in our high schools. We will also continue our partnership with Thomas Nelson, as well as have dual enrollment through New Horizons Career Technical Program. Advanced Placement. Students can begin taking advanced placements their freshman year of high school. They can take it face-to-face -face in a traditional classroom setting, or they can take it online. Qualifying scores on an AP exam allows potential college credit to be earned. Excuse me, this is transferable. Let me slow down. Qualifying scores between three and five on an AP exam earn college credits. The tr they're transferable by the post-secondary institutions, they review them. So for example, if a student is taking AP Psychology, they can actually go on VCU's website or Virginia Tech's website, and in a search menu, they can type in AP scores, and it actually gives them a PDF of the AP courses that are transferable to that university and the score that they're looking for. A lot of students are visual, so to be able to go to the college of their choice and see the scores really helps motivate them. The IB program is at Hampton High School. High school and college credits with qualifying scores on the exam are evaluated by the post-secondary institution. Dual enrollment. Students may begin to enroll in dual enrollment courses their junior or senior year of high school. Earning a C or higher in the course allows for the class to be transferred to a college or university. Thomas Nelson has guaranteed admission agreements with over 20 schools. That's phenomenal. So a lot of the kids who may start off at Thomas Nelson but wish to transfer to Hampton University, Norfolk State, ODU, William & Mary, UVA, they have this potential opportunity ahead of them. Thank you. Good evening, school board. My name is Jennifer Oliver, and I'm excited to share with you um, a little more about our dual enrollment course offerings that we will be um, having at all four of our high schools. Um, but what I, I do want to start off by saying is, is that the district works so hard in intentionally providing opportunities to um, enhance our students' opportunities for admission to post-secondary institutions, as well as training opportunities um, in our community. And what we have identified as a challenge is that of what we call an aspiration gap, where the students have dreams of what they would like to do, yet they're not quite sure how to get, <coughs> how to get there. So we, um, in, in rolling out this dual enrollment program, we really foresee that this program will close that aspirations gap and give students a direct line into their success after graduation from Hampton City Schools. Specifically, the dual enrollment program focuses on our juniors and seniors at the high school level. And what the students are able to do is obtain college credit while simultaneously earning uh, Hampton City Schools credit towards graduation and that of obtaining a diploma. 
So some of the benefits of dual enrollment, of course, we could have probably d dedicated about four slides <laughs> for this purpose, um, but we have five specifically that we will be sharing with you all as well as our families that are interested in participating. Um, the first is, is that we want this experience to be positive for the students. And so by implementing the dual enrollment program in our, in our high schools, in our classrooms, the students are in a familiar setting. They're going to be interacting with students that they see on a daily basis. They will also be taught by faculty members within the Hampton City Schools um, District. Also, students are going to get an opportunity and a head start on college. So they will have firsthand experience um, and of the rigors that college has for them um, in the near future. Something that is a fantastic resource for our students and the parents is the fact that once a student is enrolled in the in-school dual enrollment program, they automatically get all of the resources that Thomas Nelson has to offer. And that includes accessing their library, using their research database, um, even something just you know as far as going to their student, their student lounge area. If they're having study groups, they'll be able to meet each other there um, to work on homework. It, it's, that, it's that direct line to college that we're looking to provide for them. Also, this is going to save our families money on tuition. So we are able to hopefully provide this opportunity for our families and our students at no cost. And that will include the textbooks as well. Um, for many of us that have children that are in college right now, we know that a science book could cost about $400, and that's just one book. So um, in addition to the tuition, you know, the textbooks will be provided at no cost. And last Lastly, something that's important from a district um, perspective and as well as our families is just the fact that this is going to improve college persistence. So it's not just about making sure our students have opportunities to get to college, but also to make sure that they stay there and that they feel that they're successful in their commencement of an advanced degree. Um, and also college grades, you know, it's we have a lot of research that supports our in-school dual enrollment and shows that students that have access to these uh, rigorous courses and college credit in high school often then have higher grades at the post-secondary level. Okay, so our dual enrollment program, our in-school dual enrollment program, um, aligns perfectly with our strategic goal to maximize every child's learning. Again, it's going back to um, ensuring that our that we're closing that gap for the aspirations of our students and making sure that we're giving them a direct line to their future and their success. The college level classes are partnered with Thomas Nelson, so Thomas Nelson will be is reviewing all of the curriculum in addition to our curriculum leaders within the school system, and those will be rolled out at all four high schools. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, the classes will be taught by all of our uh, well-qualified Hampton City Schools faculty members, and there will be a partnership with Thomas Nelson where the faculty, our Hampton City Schools faculty members will have um, support from Thomas Nelson in rolling out those classes. Mm -hmm. All right, um, dual enrollment eligibility. So students, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna take Genevieve's place. <laughs> I told you I could talk about this forever. We do this a lot, we've done this a lot. So she's just rolling right into it. So good evening, everyone. So in terms of eligibility, <laughs> I love her. Um, so in terms of eligibility, we are looking presently at students who are rising juniors and seniors. So you'll need to be a junior or senior in order to participate in this particular program. Obviously, since they are still students, there will be a parental permission piece of this. Um, as much as we encourage them to do things independently, we want to make sure that the families know what's happening. Um, and all of the students actually do have to admit um, meet admissions criteria according to uh, Thomas Nelson's standards and, and guidelines because again they are Thomas Nelson students um, on the collegiate side of the house. So that criteria, what is that? Students can participate in the program, again if they're juniors or seniors, but in terms of testing there is a Virginia placement test also known as the B VPT. If students do not meet certain testing criteria with things that they've already taken in terms of passing an SOL or having taken an SAT, ACT, or PSAT, then they would need to take the placement test itself, depending on the course that they're looking at, either an English test or a math test. However, 
everyone at this point in time will have taken an algebra SOL. So if we have a student who's looking at taking a math class that we're offering, we are going to take a look at their SOLs. If they've passed their Algebra 1 SOL, then they're exempt from having to take that particular test. If they are looking at maybe taking um, our English 111 or English 112 class, they haven't taken the test. We're trying to determine if they need to take it. We're going to take a look at their PSAT scores. Um, if they have scored a 50 on the test that they most recently took, then they will be able to be exempt from the test. Same thing if they've taken the SAT or the ACT, if they scored either a 500 or an 18 in those particular categories, then they would be exempt from the testing. If for some reason they haven't made those scores, then we would require that they take the test. A sample of courses. The district is actually looking to offer a myriad of courses, um, but some basic courses that we feel are very foundational. Um, when we're looking at trying to get the students ready, not only for Thomas Nelson, but for those students where they know that they are interested in going to uh, VCU or ODU, everyone has to take an English 101 class, right? Everyone has to sort of take that basic math class, that college algebra. So we're trying to help them kind of knock out some of those core foundational courses. So we're looking at the English 111, 112 course, which is an English composition class. Like students who pass that again uh, would come out with six college credits just off of that one year of, of English. Um, we're looking at a history 121 and 122, which is a US history course. Again, six college hours by the end of it if they were to pass. And the math analysis, which, which is uh, equivalent to a college level algebra, if the students were to take that, they would come out with three college hours. My apologies, that's right. Okay, um, in addition to these courses, I apologize, I mentioned it in a global kind of way and kept moving. Uh, some other courses that we are looking at offering, uh, there are some science offerings, there's chemistry, there's a biology, there's an oceanography, which is extremely exciting in my opinion. Um, we have a music class that we're looking at and um, marketing, a couple of business class, accounting and marketing as well. So again, a myriad of classes that we're hoping to offer the students. So where does this all fit in, right? There's a, the big plan, we want to get everybody graduated, but then what, right? So looking at dual enrollment, here we are foundationally in terms of the high school. We're trying to allow them the opportunity to not only achieve their high school diplomas and obtain the high school diplomas, but we're trying to give them some outlets in terms of um, post-secondary education. So here we are with dual enrollment really being a foundational piece of um, a sort of a stackable, pipeline of educational goals. So if we have those students that are looking at maybe going on, studying psychology, getting a master's, getting their doctorate, we're lining them up with that. But we also realize that, you know, that additional seven years of education may not be for everyone or depending on their interests, that's not where they need to line up. So I'm trying to assist the students in doing things that will allow for industry credentials, getting them sort of set up in terms of maybe an associate's degree where that's appropriate for what they're looking for. We're giving them the tools at this particular level to be able to obtain those goals. Good evening. My name is Yasmin Ray. Um, I'm currently a Thomas Nelson Community College student. And as of this year, I will be transferring to VCU for a School of Arts of Cinema for BA. Um, I have worked with Ms. Olive. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm so used to calling her Ms. Markham. I've known Ms. 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 Olive since middle school, onward to high school, and I am a product of dual enrollment. I, for, from personal experience, I know this for a fact that it really works for students in the field of study. It helps me a lot. Um, I was one of those ones that were, uh, had everything in perspective, everything my major, um, my career I wanted to set out to be, but there were obstacles in the way of that. And Ms. Markham actually helped me to break those obstacles in many ways. Um, I actually graduated um, ahead of my class. I have an honors and advanced diploma and with a GPA of a 3.95. And I'll go all, I earn it all from just dual enrollment. It really helps 
with resumes, with filling out applications, with understanding what is being asked of me from each college perspective. Um, I always went to Ms. Markham in regards of these things. So dual enrollment to me, I feel as though it's a part of me. You know, when you take something away from a student that needs these things, we need these things. We need help in certain areas. We might have the idea of what we want to do and the mindset of what we want to do, but we need those people in line to help us, to put it together, to map it out for us. Because not all of us have those qualities of mapping it out and doing it and actually you know, talking about it and, and getting our work done. Um, <laughs> it's just been um, a great time for me, actually, during this time, Ms. Markham, like I said before, and dual enrollment has been an awesome privilege to be in. And I see it as a help meet. I see it as a help for the students, not just for, you know, um, the Hampton High School, but for students all around. We need a foundation to stand on. We need, we need these people in line, because without Ms. Markham or Ms. Cartwright or dual enrollment, I would not be standing here today saying that I am transferring for um, my bachelor's associate's degree in cinema. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Joan Patterson. I have a daughter who is currently dual enrolled um, both at Thomas Nelson um, for differential equations and at Christopher Newport for business French. And she takes <coughs> classes on those campuses. So my perspective is uh, with regard to going to the campuses to take um, courses, and my comments will kind of reflect that. But um, there's a wide array of course options available. For the student whose um, needs may not be met within the traditional framework, there are some diverse alternatives. And for Anna, the French that was offered at Hampton City Schools was not a good match for her. Um, she went to Thomas Nelson and sub subsequently CNU, and that provided her with opportunities to study in more depth in an environment that met her needs much better. Um, she fell in love with CNU and will continue there next year. Uh, shortens a college, the time to attain a college degree. Anna will graduate with at least 23 transferable credits. Um, that does not include the AP and IB classes that she is taking this year. Um, this, so we'll see what happens with those. She will only need two additional 300 level French classes and one cross-cultural awareness class for a minor in French um, when she transfers. And um, for some students, the general gen ed requirements will be met then they can dive into their area of concentration. And um, something about dual enrollment, it's not in getting the credits, it's not always about uh, you know, graduating college early or um, you know, moving on. For some students, students with health concerns or other challenges, the credits that they earn could allow the student to moderate the college pace so they can complete a degree in four years or perhaps enable them to um, take on the added pressure of sports or other extracurricular activities that they might not be able to do. Um, with regard to the transition from high school to college, um, I think that this is a program that can accommodate students with an asynchronous development. Um, some students are intellectually capable, not necessarily mature enough for a full college experience, and the arrangement allows them to continue to develop as a high school student with their peers here while gaining exposure to the academic stimulation, maturity, and intellectual development of the college situation. And I think it's been very useful for my child. The resources involved, um, I think we're all pretty aware of, but um, we can't forget the full range of professional resources and journals like PubMed, um, all the different um, things that college has to offer, and the opportunities to engage in group projects with more committed and mature students that our student that my daughter has had in um, the CNU setting. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm just delighted to be here, and I'd also like to share greetings from Dr. Dr. John Denver, Denver, Dever, the president of Thomas Nelson, and also Dr. Dan Lufkin, the vice president for student affairs. Um, I know they won't toot their own horn, so I'll toot it for them. I'd really like to commend the work of the design team. Um, they have 
just been so organized and brought us together multiple times, both at the school board office um, downtown and also they've been very gracious and willing to come to our campus. Um, I'm also pleased to say that on the academic side of Thomas Nelson, our four academic deans have been more engaged in this process than I've ever seen in the past. I've been at Thomas Nelson for almost 10 years. Um, we have tried to have dual enrollment efforts in the past, but sometimes the moon and the stars all align, and I think now is that time. Um, we believe we've already got 15 classes that we're probably gonna be able to offer this fall, and we have at least 11 that we're still looking at. So that's a very large number of classes, especially from zero to that many in one year. Um, there's a lot of work. Our policies are very complex and convoluted as a result of being part of a Virginia State system. Um, so some of the craziness is not necessarily Thomas Nelson crazy, but statewide crazy. Um, but as we all know, these are the rules and we need to follow them. And uh, your staff, your administrators have been wonderful to work with. Uh, it's been very pleasant. Um, just as a parent as well, um, both of my children participated in dual enrollment and I think it was a wonderful experience for them. I actually started my work at Thomas Nelson 10 years ago as a dual enrollment coordinator. So um, been very involved. I think it, it does nothing but good for the students. It, um, there's a variety of ways we can offer it in the school, on the campus, um, as she mentioned, and it just provides, um, and as your awesome student, that was just, you know, warmed my heart. Um, it's, it's just a program that's fun to be involved in. It's great for students. Um, so thanks again for having us. We're really excited about the partnership, and um, we're just gonna get back to work, right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So next steps. We will be busy in April working with the registration process with our students, uh, necessary testing for those who need testing. As has been mentioned, it's really exciting to connect our faculty with Thomas Nelson faculty so that we can make sure that we are as rigorous as Thomas Nelson is with the work that, that happens on their campus. Um, the other piece that we discuss with Thomas Nelson are the opportunities that lie ahead for our students in high demand career fields. Um, we've talked about cybersecurity, perhaps developing that as part of our future academy work, emergency medical services, there's a high need for that, mechatronics technology, some of the emerging areas that are in high demand. So this alignment with the K-12 experience and post-secondary education with our community and our business partners as we do this work to develop our wall-to-wall -wall academies will really ensure that our students graduate college, career, and life ready, which is so important. So we're encouraging our young people to get the jump on their college and careers with dual enrollment in Hampton City Schools. And we certainly are all available to help our parents to understand uh, the program, the work that we're doing, and we're fortunate to have uh, the college and career counselors in our schools. I think we'll have one joining a college and career counselor at Bethel. Uh, that she's already on board, so we have one. We'll need to add that name as well. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work with, about the dual enrollment design team. They are very, very committed, uh, and we're really excited to continue the work. This is just a, a update on where we are at this point. Great, thank you, and, and um, it sounds like great progress has taken place, uh, and it's very exciting for us to hear. Are there questions or comments from board members? I know Mrs. Henry is just itching to, to uh, this is her. Dr. Smith knows this is something I get, I get very, very excited about it. The first, I think our very first conversation when he became superintendent was, okay, what are we gonna do about dual enrollment? Um, I, and I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate the dean and, and Ms. Patterson's comments very much. Uh, just a couple practical questions. Scheduling's already been started in high school, so when we say we're going to schedule in April, this is going to have to be rolled out as a, as a banner headline, pay attention here, this is a new opportunity. So I know that Ms. Galata and all the counselors and everybody is going to get on that. Principals, too, are going to be excited about, about pitching this to their students so that they don't miss out on this opportunity. So. Um, that was one question that I think you sort of answered you, when you said April, I guess there's a plan to do that. Yeah, that. And, and in fact, we actually had parent orientations mm -hmm. um, at all four high schools, March, 
Yeah. So it was mentioned. Here it co it's coming. Yes. Pay attention. So, Good. So okay. they're aware that it's coming. It's on the websites. Parents can actually go to the websites and opt in so that they can opt in to the testing um, okay. because we do need that, parent That was permission. my other question is about the testing. Is the VPT <coughs> equivalent to Thomas Nelson's like entrance exam? It is. It is Thomas Nelson's. Uh, for all the community colleges, use the same yes. one. So, okay. I knew there was such a, an exam out there. I just didn't know its name. And so we have the other option of some kids won't actually have to take that if they can meet a requirement with some of those other demonstrated skills you mentioned. Correct. Well, that's Through cool. PSAT, SAT, ACT, uh, and, and, and SOL for math. I have to say I got more excited because when you started saying, okay, we can take English and history, all right, yes, practically that's something you want to get out of the way of your four-year degree. But if I'm a kid who doesn't know I want to do a four-year degree, I'm not real excited about taking another English and history class. It, is, it can be the same history and English class you're taking anyway, which makes it better. But um, the idea that we're going to explore other options, and I, I particularly enjoyed Ms. Patterson's remarks about giving students the option to explore in a different direction that's that's unique to them and their goals. So I am super, super excited about this. I, if, you, you, if your team needs a cheerleader, get me the pom-poms. I will be out in the street cheering for you because this is this is very, very exciting. We, we talked about it 10 years ago. It was mentioned like it was a possibility and nothing happened. And so I, I really am excited to see it happening and I, I will, if you want people to stand out and front of the school and say sign up for dual enrollment and like the the tax ladies I will do that because this is this is really really exciting for students and I know and, you're on camera right <laughs> <laughs> oh well so we're gonna re we, we have a record of that uh, <laughs> it's it's just so important for for students I like the phrase aspiration gap that's that's wonderful kids would say to me all the time let's I, what do you want to do? I want to go to college. Well, what do you want to study? Well, I don't know. Have you done anything to prepare for that? Well, no. You need to have, it gives students confidence that they can go to the next step. And I, it's so exciting, and I'm just thrilled that, that with this, Dr. Woods. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And, and thank the team, because it really is a Absolutely. team effort. Other comments or questions, uh, Mr. Samuels? Dr. Woods, I have a comment first. I just want to um, say this is a, a great opportunity um, for Hampton City Schools to focus on maximizing all the opportunities to ensure that our students have a head start. Correct. So, <coughs> great work. The other question that I, th this, I have two questions. The first question, can you share about the cross-pollination of our teachers working with Thomas Nelson faculty to make sure that they are receive all the qualifications or training that is needed to make sure that our student receive the rigor um, so they can be successful. And also, how many credit hours can, a, can our students take per semester? Chris, do you have a maximum on the number of credits? There's Typically 12? That, that we allow first-time students to take just from a success perspective, but that that, that rarely happens in a in a high school campus because they're not every class they take isn't going to be a dual enrollment class. So yes, there are limits, but it's not going to really apply in a high school setting. Do you want me to talk about the credential too? Yes. Um, essentially, you need. Sorry. <laughs> um, we Hampton started out the smartest way they could have started out. They started out with the, with the HR director, um, because until we have teachers, there's no need to talk about classes. So um, the first thing that they did, which which made a lot of the follow-on work much simpler, was to simply to identify teachers that would have the credentials, um, and to teach a transfer level class. Um, and just stop me if I'm getting too far in the weeds. Um, a master's in the content area or 18 graduate hours in the content area. So the distinction comes in, you have a lot of very qualified teachers that have master's degrees, but a lot of those are masters in teaching something. And it must be a straight up master's in English, master's in math, master's in history. Those aren't quite as easy to find, but you actually have a lot more than we thought you did. Um, so that, we've been going back and forth, um, looking at transcripts. 
Now that we have some teachers that, we, that can meet the credentialing requirements, now we're gonna to start to look at the courses. So there will be a collaboration between our faculty and yours. Um, we will provide them with courses of study, sample syllabi, um, sample exams. Um, we actually have a template, um, learning outcomes and all that good stuff. And so your teachers will start to put together, you know, based on how they want to do their, you know, there's some individuality permitted in this. And then we'll take a look and there'll be some back and forth. And I think in the next few weeks or so, um, our biology and chemistry faculty will actually be coming out to visit the schools. Um, we need to take a peek at the labs to make sure your Bunsen burners and all that um, is equivalent. So there, there will be some talking back and forth. And in, in my opinion, um, the more talking back and forth, the, the better the program is. Um, because then we know that everybody's really engaged, people actually have faces and names and email addresses, and if they um, get in trouble or just have a question at any time during the term, they have somebody they can reach out to. Great, and I know I may be getting into weeds, but is this an opportunity for um, teachers to earn additional income if they teach in additional courses on that level? We're not... Um we're going to keep our teachers on our side of okay. the right. ledger right. Um, yes. and hoping that we don't lose them to Thomas Nelson because there are opportunities Because we, we don't there. want that. And certainly some of our staff currently work with Thomas Nelson, yes. you know, as adjunct in the, in the afternoons and the like. Uh, but we're not encouraging anyone to go. And we're not poaching. Full okay. time. Okay, uh, good. We want them to stay with us. So. We do want to offer, though, um, Thomas Nelson's Educational Foundation. Um, recognizes that you have some teachers that might be quite close to the 18 graduate hours, um, maybe a class or two away, and I'm in the middle of writing a proposal to the foundation to support um, those teachers and maybe taking a class or two um, to get them to that level and then, of course, bringing them into the, the dual enrollment fold. Great. Thank you so much. You're I really welcome. appreciate that. Other questions, Mrs. Smith? Um, yeah, I had a, just a couple follow-up questions past those ones. They took some of my questions. <laughs> but um, before I do that, I just wanted to share that um, my daughter graduated four years ago and had many dual enrollment through the governor's school. And um, it, it was incredible. Um, it, it was a great opportunity. It really was. And the smooth transition, because she went to Virginia Tech Engineering, and there were so many other students that were struggling that didn't have that experience. And she just went right into it, no problem, no hiccups. I mean, it was, it was a great experience, and working with Thomas Nelson was very easy. Um, doing, and when they say the credits transfer, they do very easily, and it, it's very simple. It's, there's nothing complicated about it. So I just wanted to share that, that it's just, it's a wonderful thing, it really is, and the flexibility that it has with that pipeline you showed, and how it can help with those students that want the associates, want to go a certain direction, those that want to go maybe the four-year, you know, it, it applies to all of our students, so it's a great, a great thing to have out there. Um, some of my questions were, first was, do all the high schools, are they going to have the same class offerings, all the students at all the high schools? There, there is variability based okay. on the faculty uh, credentialing piece. So, okay, that makes you know, sense. as Chris mentioned, as quickly as we can certify adjunct, you know, then we can offer the courses. So there is variability depending on the faculty who meets the criteria for adjunct status. Okay. We'll just keep building, building That's on right. those areas of strength as Dr. Smith keeps. I, I know Dr. Smith <laughs> is ready to jump in, but one of the things that we're actually doing um, in working with our terrific human resources department, as we are searching for teachers, we're actually looking for those who have their masters in field. Um, so uh, Ms. Marcella notified me yesterday. She says, I'm going through the uh, transcripts, and here's one who meets the criteria, I believe, because they're, they're teaching adjunct at you know, another college. And so Phoebus High School picked up that instructor, signed the contract, so we have another one that will be coming. Uh, we're, we're pretty certain that she'll meet the criteria. We're learning a little bit more about um, the graduate level studies. But of course, um, Thomas Nelson uh, has the last word in terms of you know, with their deans of their colleges if in fact they meet the criteria. But that's a, a way that we can grow as we find candidates who have those credentials, um, then we can offer additional courses. And so that's our direction that okay. we'll go. Okay, good. And um, one last question. Um, 
since the students have to have certain prereqs and have to place placement, pass placement exams and meet certain criteria, is, what is the reason that it's only juniors and seniors that are allowed to do this? That's a... That's a, that's a state policy. Oh, okay. Uh, from the Virginia Community College system. Okay. Juniors and seniors. Okay. And while we were talking about that, another partnership piece with Thomas Nelson that we didn't get into is the fact that they have testing coaches. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? They actually had a meeting today. Um, we have a testing coach on campus. It's a new position for us. Uh, we recognize that the VPT is a different assessment than the students have ever seen. It's not like the SAT, the SOL, or anything else. Um, it's a computer adaptive test. So. Um, what really shocks the students is can be the length. It's an untimed test because the better you do in math, the longer the test takes. So sometimes the students are feeling particularly persecuted. Um, you know, will this never end? Will this never end? And it's it, it's actually a good sign. But if nobody ever tells them that, um, you know, and they, they come to campus on a lunch break or something, they don't really have that much time, and time's running out, and they're getting to the end, and they just start clicking through to be finished, and they don't realize the stakes of the tests that they're taking. So um, testing coaching was a position that we now have so that we can make sure we talk to the students before they take the test, calm them down a little bit. It's a, it's a fine line to not scare them to death, but also it's very important that they take the time and try really hard on this exam. Um, so the, the ladies met and they came up with some dates and our testing coach will come out and talk to any classroom that would like to have them. Okay. Um, there's also a practice test the students can take and like anything else, just a little bit of familiarity goes a long way. Um, I will share that we did something similar like this with Menchville High School and the results of the group that tested were much better than I would have expected from a similar group that actually came on campus. So we have, we have hope. Plus when they test in, in the high school, Again, it's familiar. Um, we break it into two, um, two days of testing because that's another thing that happens on campus. The students are determined to do it all in one sitting. It can take as long as four hours. If you're not prepared for that and you're hungry, or, you know, there's, there's a million reasons why they not, might not maximize that testing experience. So we're trying to make sure that they do. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from Ms. board members? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Ms. Mr. Harper. Yes. Great work that you ladies are doing. Uh, people sleep on junior college for some reason, even those that aren't involved in the dual enrollment program. I, I for one, uh, attended Thomas Nelson and later transferred to Norfolk State, but it, it gave me the opportunity to get used to college. Right. Um, a lot of kids go off to four year schools, and by Christmas they're back home. They've plunked right. out, party too much, or whatever. That's what we got. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I guess my question is, once the child chooses a curriculum, they have to, uh, if, if, and if they're involved in the dual enrollment program, then there has to be a dual enrollment class. They have particular classes for dual enrollment. I, right. In other words, I couldn't take a, um, um, an elective through the dual enrollment program. Yes, we, we plan to offer some electives. Um, for students, for example, uh, music, music theory type courses we're planning to start. So um, students will be able to take some electives and of course I know they will be interested in those transferring as possible because we all know we can have some elective courses in, in college. So it was important to the design team that we really work with students around the pathways and helping students with their interest and we know that we have students with interest in art and music. And so as quickly as we can scale up um, electives, we will. Again, it is working with our faculty and making sure we, we meet the credentialing with Thomas Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Um, again, thank you all very much for the report. It was very thorough and it was great to hear all the different perspectives uh, from parents and student and, and the design team members that are, are really doing work. But that was a great testimonial and um, so nice to hear, you know, from, 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 from you, Yasmin, um, what a great experience that's been for you and what a leg up you feel like it's given you and, uh, and uh, given you an avenue to go to VCU and, and uh, really do some fun things, it sounds like, uh, academically. Um, so that's really great. Um, Dr. Woods, you were talking about um, the credentialing of teachers and, and all of that. How long will that particular part of the process take? Do we know how? 
Longer yeah. than long. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, <coughs> the first part's not so hard, the um, looking at transcripts, although there was a little bit of back and forth. The next part is actually quite hard. Um, developing the curriculum, mm -hmm. making sure the, you have a lot more seat time in your term than we do. We just need to make sure that all the elements that we need to be covered will be covered. Um, a lot depends on how quickly your teachers get things to us, and a lot depends on how quickly ours respond back. Um, yours are teaching, ours are teaching, summer's coming. Um, we all kind of know that, so we're really going to try to get everything wrapped up before our, our faculty leave mid-May. We have some that are still there in the summer, but we're going we're gonna to want to be wrapping it up as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, obviously, we're all um, excited and anxious to, to see it move forward and <coughs> happy to hear all the great work that's been great. done so far. So looking forward to this tremendous partnership, which will, will provide even better opportunities for our students in Hampton, and that's really yes. what, what we're all about. So we're thrilled to have the report. Dr. Smith? No, no other comments. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Woods, and certainly <laughs> members of, uh, of the design team. Um, of course, you know that I'm, I'm very excited. And uh, uh, on yesterday, we had an opportunity, uh, members of uh, Hampton City Schools, in terms of um, members of the, the division leadership team, along with members of Thomas Nelson Community College in terms of the deans and uh, vice presidents along with their president, uh, Dr. Dever, we had a conversation regarding dual enrollment and our uh, current reality and uh, that we're building from places of strength. And so we both are very much on board and uh, supportive. And, and so yesterday was just really an update for both the president, certainly the superintendent, uh, regarding the progress. <coughs> so thank you for your hard work. I look forward to uh, uh, more great news. Thank you. Are there any additional reports for you, Dr. Smith? Yes, let's see. Um, the digital survey update, and we have Mr. John Eagle. Um, Good evening. I'm going to do the presentation from here so I can be one with the computer and you know, one with the computer. The okay. So. <laughs> Okay, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, student representative, Ms. Syria Lewis, Dr. Smith, and guests. I'm here tonight to talk about the digital school survey and an update. We do participate in the digital school survey every year. Um, when you, most people think of the sur a survey, they think of what's your opinion. This is not that kind of survey. It is more like what a surveyor does. They're getting the lay of the land. They're getting an understanding of what it is that we do, uh, the kinds of things that we do, and what we have installed, and what we are using. And of course, this is um, regarding technology. We submitted an application December 17th. Uh, the survey format is fairly intense. It's done online. Um, they do divide it into small, medium, and large jurisdictions, and we are in the large category. It's 12,000 students or more. Uh, and they released the results at the National Schools Board Association. This year it's in Boston from April 9th to 11th. It's about 20 pages long. Um, there's lots of narratives and um, lots of questions. So again, it's, it's fairly intense. Um, the results are tabulated by an organization called the Center for Digital Government. They're sort of a think tank that look at a variety of different um, uses for technology in all levels of government, city, K-12, higher ed, um, state and federal government, as well as agencies and so forth. And they partner with the National School Boards Association. And um, basically, they take all this information and then they rank it and they um, publish the top 10 rankings. And they say, you know, it's, it's basically they award to those school divisions that are most fully implement technology be benchmarks in the evolution of digital education as represented in the survey questions. And so the questions do change from year to year because obviously technology changes as well. And last year, we were number two. So I'm going to go through these. I, I wish I could take credit. No, scratch that. I, if I could take credit, we wouldn't do so well in the digital school survey because it is a team effort. It's not just what the IT department does. It's really what this organization does. And as you'll see, um, as I go through the kinds of things that, that they ask us about, it really does cover a very, very wide range of, of different issues. 
uh, different, different areas. So one of the first things they ask us about is, what is your school board doing online? Um, <coughs> Do they have a, an agenda for your <coughs> meetings online? Yes, we do. Do you, we have uh, the supporting documentation online? Yes, we do. Do you have instructions on how to participate in the meeting minutes online? Yes, we do. Do you have the policies for the board meetings online? So we again check all the boxes on those questions. And we also tell them that we have board docs. And board docs, of course, is a fantastic search tool if you're interested in finding out something that you all discussed, I don't know, four or five years ago with a particular topic. You can actually use board docs to search for that kind of information. They also ask about what they call transparency measures. And so they ask things like, do you have information online about school choice? And yes, we do. Um, this was a new question. Um, they said, are your school board goals online? And of course, yours are. <laughs> and um, we also have our, our annual measurable objectives, our graduation rates, the ratings for individual school score, schools and test scores. Our budget is uh, published online, our technology plan, our strategic plan, annual progress indicators. And again, we um, heavily emphasize the use of board docs and give them examples and URLs. And by the way, they require all that. We have to provide them URLs and links and various things. They don't just take our word for it, so they do check and see that we do provide this information. Um, they also ask about electronic meetings, and they say, you know, do you um, project all the supporting documentation on a big screen during your meetings? <laughs> and of course we do. Um, are the meetings televised? And yes, they are. Um, they ask, are they podcasts? Now, last year we said no, um, but this year we were able to say yes, so we're very happy about that. Do we video stream them live? Yes, we do. And do we have them archived so you can watch them later online? Yes, we do. And we actually um, answered an extra credit question because in the area of podcasts, we have developed um, a program called Level Up Learning. And I don't know if you've heard this, but it's done by David Hotler and Kate Wolf. And they've done uh, dozens, I think at this point, episodes, and it is incredible. It is produced with the professionalism you see out of programs out of New York City, like Radio Lab or um, This American Life. It really, really is done extremely well. So we shared that information as well. And those are available through iTunes and all of the standard places you would find podcasts. They also ask about electronic interaction. Um, so, are our school board email addresses online? Yes, they are. We also point out that we have a student liaison um, that uh, joins us as well, that uh, most school board members have Twitter accounts. Um, is there a place to submit feedback? And you know, we had the Dev Awards previously. Of course, um, Diane Galata and her group have just done an outstanding job of redoing the website. And so there's a whole, this is actually a pasting from, from the website where people can do all of these things online. Um, do we do surveys? Oh boy, do we do surveys. Of course, we do the climate surveys every year. Um, do we have an auto notification system for calling home and delivering important messages? Of course, we do that. Do we use social media like Facebook and, and Twitter? Of course, we do that. And of course, we, we uh, introduced power tweets this year. Um, and then we also mentioned that we use, uh, our teachers use Edmodo, and we use YouTube for various things. And we have all of our policies online regarding um, the use of social media. And we do have tools for monitoring that, and we do archive certain things online regarding that. And for extra credit, we even mentioned that we have the Safe School Hotline, and my favorite, uh, the Tip Text, which is a way that uh, if a parent or a student or just a member of the community sees something at a school that they're concerned about, they could just text it, and we'll get that information. Um, they also have a section on policies for online conduct, and of course we have all of our rights and responsibilities handbook online. Um, we have a whole lot of information about cyber safety online and take-home guidelines. Those that are included in our, um, our take-home program or one-to-one -one or digital learning program. Um, and a new question they ask is, um, what about policies that apply to the board? And we were like, well, you know, uh, our board members are actually um, employees, and, and so they're, they're under the, the same standards that the rest of us are. But um, to your credit, you do a self-assessment every year, and, um, and you do have standards of conduct, and we were able to provide those links as well. Um, and then they'd ask, do you review email and social media accounts and kind of uh, monitor those sorts of things? And we do. And do we have a, a BY, a bring your own device um, policy that covers things like acceptable use and cyber privacy, theft, damage, loss? And is it signed by, by both? And of course, that's incorporated into our rights and responsibilities handbook. So we're able to provide all that information as well. 
Another new section that they had this year was uh, what they call the governance plan for student data. And so the first question they asked is, do you have an, a student information system framework that maps out how your student information system hooks up to all of the other systems? And we're like, oh boy, do we. <laughs> so this is our, actually our chart from last year. We have about 30 different interfaces to our student information system. And this is in the process of being updated. It's going to be close to probably 45 by this summer with the incorporation of um, digital textbooks and other kinds of digital content that are becoming available. Um, so they ask us, do we use data for multiple sources? And of course, we do for all of these things that involve our learning management system as we call it, and do we integrate this data into dashboards. We have dashboards in, in areas across various different systems, which I'll cover again in another slide. Do we track data longitudinally? Of course we do. And do we have a data, data governance policy in regards to privacy and records? And, and of course we do as well as uh, follow the FERPA laws and regulations too. And then they ask us questions about um, the public's electronic access to certain things. So for example, um, do the school administrators or principals and assistant principals and so forth have their emails available online? And yes, they do. Um, what about the rest of the staff? And we actually have a full online directory available. Um, now this one, um, we continue to have to answer no to. They say, do we have an actual policy that says, if you get an email, you're going to respond within a specific amount of time. Do you have a policy? And we don't have a policy, but the way we answer that question is that we have a culture. Um, we have a culture of customer service. We don't feel like we need a policy. We are expected to respond the same day. Um, and our so I know for a fact our social media responses are probably within the hour, I'm guessing, something very close to that. Um, and we do have, again, those feedback pages and the hotline, the tip text, and those kinds of things. So. So again, um, um, I think we do very well in that category. And then they ask us about student and parent electronic access. Do students have email? Every one of our students have email. And again, those are restricted accounts, so they are secure. Um, and teachers can interact through email with all of our students, and they do. Um, and what about communication with parents? And again, our parents, um, we do have a parent portal, as well as a student portal. Um, and oh, let me mention about that too, because I just read those stats earlier today, because I was curious about it. See, we right. We have about 50% participation rate. I hopefully we'll see that rise um, um, at the, towards the end of this year and going into next year. But it's kind of interesting because we have come so far. <coughs> there has been over a million <coughs> logins into the parent portal and the student portal since September 8th. On any given day, there is almost 1,000 logins by parents and over 4,000 logins by students. So they're using the heck out of those systems. Um, we also mentioned that we use Google Classroom and Hangouts. Of course, we do have the Hampton City Schools app. Um, and they do ask this question. They say it's for data collection only, but do we do let students use their own email addresses? And we do let them if, if and there's cases where we encourage them to, if they're applying for a job or something, you know, we want them to, to use a personal account. Um, again, they, I mentioned this earlier, they asked us about dashboards. We do use dashboards in our, what we call our R RTI system in FileMaker. Um, we also have some that are an interactive achievement and the data that we pull out of that that we sort of come through and then provide back to the schools. PowerSchool itself has some dashboards and we have a variety of different operational dashboards. Those are actually mine, or some of mine. Um, and then they ask us about emergency preparation. Um, and then place of emergencies, do we have a plan in place? Yes, we do. Do we have a notification system? And again, we do with the school messenger. Do we conduct drills? Yes, we do. Do we coordinate with local responders? Yes. Do we take backups of our data? We better be. <laughs> and then they ask us, you know, is there anything else we would like to add? And, and there's actually a whole lot of things that we do. We have GPS on our bus systems to help track those. We do the Raptor ID check, you know, so people can't just walk into a school unidentified. We have those front door entry systems with the video surveillance systems. We have digital signs that can also double in times of emergency to display important information. Um, even our phone intercom system allows us the ability to blast messages in real time across the entire division or in single, um, in, in particular buildings and things like Google um, pop-up chat. Um, they ask us if we have plans for cyber di disruptions and if we do testing with our backups and we do those regularly as well. And then they ask us again and again about social media and we do, of course, use social media in the midst of in the event of an emergency. At this point in the survey, we're at question 43 and they're asking us about digital curriculum. 
And um, again, we have so much, and I want to thank um, all the curriculum le leaders and Paul Lawrence and people um, that I partner with that do so much. And they ask us about electronic textbooks, and um, we, we're just really getting started with electronic textbooks. We have some, but um, we also mentioned that we're also participating in exploring open education resources, or OERs which um, the trend is, is not so much about a book anymore where everything is located in one resource, but instead you pull from various places on the web and have those indexed so that it's essentially the collection of everything that would normally be in a book, but it's not necessarily being a book anymore. And the great thing about OERs is that they're free. They've already been developed by other educators and been approved either by the state or the federal government or both in some cases. Um, the Obama administration started the hashtag go open. Uh, the state is a partner with that, and we were partnered with that with WHRO. So lots going on there. We also use things like Nearpod and um, Socrative and the Promethean flip charts. We've got virtual labs and the interactive achievement um, assessments, online learning platforms, our partnership with WHRO um, and Desire to Learn and Edmodo, Schoolology, Schoology, um, Google Classroom, Brain Pop, Emedia VA, Vocabulary, Gale, Cengage Learning, Pebble Go, Tumble Book, and World Book. And again, there's just so much that we do with that. It's it's quite exciting. The Oscars ask us about classroom alternatives, um, and we list that we do use Edgenuity, we do use Virtual Tutor, and the Edgenuity My Path Systems Desire to Learn. Again, that's with WHRO the Google Apps for Education suite. And we do some video conferencing up from time to time um, with NASA or even other countries. And then they ask us about student training careers. And so they ask us questions like, do you have keyboarding classes? And we have lots of keyboarding classes. And we also have a Microsoft IT Academy, which offers Microsoft um, Office certifications and more. Um, again, I mentioned the Google Drive and Google Apps. Um, we have training in preventing cyberbullying and other digital literacy courses. Of course, we ha have the K-12 STEM pathway. We have the IC3, which is the computing core certification in industry credentials. A lot of this is um, Whitney's area, uh, Ketchledge's area, and so I want to thank her for providing this information. The 3D parametric modeling, um, multi-sim, edge cam, Autodesk, Robot C, Photoshop, Adobe, and Design Dreamweaver. This year we did the Hour of Code. I don't know if you remember that. There was an email going around where we're encouraging students to get involved in computer programming because kids, a lot of times, they don't realize that it's something they would be really good at until they've tried it a little bit. So that was very successful. And of course, our student operated technical support um, center, which we're very excited about. They ask us specifically about digital literacy. We could always do more in this area. I'm, you know, I, again, it's, it's something that we strive to, to get better at every year. But we do um, try to do what we can with the orientations, um, with our, um, our, again, our digital learning program, the one-to-one the -one website. We do offer the iTunes University course. We do have YouTube videos. Um, participate in parent workshops. We partner with the PTA whenever we can. Uh, we have been working with a company called Everfi to develop a digital literacy online course that I think is probably already being used and also partner with Project Inclusion, which is a, a uh, program regarding keeping schools safe. I know I'm going really quick, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, Mobile devices, um, so they ask us, do we have a strategy? It's like, oh, do we have a strategy? We have actually deployed 10,800 mobile devices already, and you're well aware that we started a Chromebook pilot um, this spring as well. Uh, they ask us about some of the resources we provide, and of course we do have that really spectacular student-produced care video um, that the students did. We do offer professional development on apps. We pro offer professional development on our policies. We have a very, I think, our program is getting very mature. It's, it's very exciting. You know, we have insurance for accidental device protection. We have multi-student discounts and waivers. We have a system, a device management system that lets us track devices outside of our network. We have age-appropriate restrictions, and we do have physical security. So we're able to hit all of the points that they asked about on that. They also asked ask specifically about online functionality of, of websites. And here I'd like to give the teachers a shout out because some of the teachers, a lot of the teachers have created just phenomenal websites with a variety of different resources. Um, some of the ones that have lectures or recordings or links to um, 
special videos or, or Khan Academy, all just kinds of things that the teachers have done with lectures and you know, incorporating Edmodo and Wixi and eMedia VA, all great resources. Of course, I mentioned the, um, the parent portal and the student portal. Um, and this year we also, with um, the guidance services, uh, introduced Naviance where students can go in and with their parents, students and parents can go in and create a 10 year academic plan for their student. So it gives them a way to really um, plan out and map out the kinds of courses that they want to take. And again, can't go without mentioning Google Drive and the digital portfolio. What's different this year, too, about Google Drive is that these accounts are going to stay with the students. And so this fall, or I should say during the summer, those accounts are still available. And so if the students want to use those accounts over the summer, they can. And when they get back to school in the fall, all of the things that they have created and stored will still be there from year to year. So they can continue to, to use those. Um, and again, they ask us about social media, and yes, we have online. Um, they also ask us about technology professional development. And here again is um, one area where you know, they ask us, is it mandated? And we do have, there is a mandate for TSIPs required by state law, but it's only at the beginning of a teacher's tenure. Um, and, we, and we have so much technology professional development that's available. We have multiple technology-based instructional training opportunities during the year with Nearpod, Socrative, again, Google App for Education, the um, Prometheum, Active Inspire. There's a summer ed camp with Virtual Virginia, Desire to Learn, Document Cameras, um, uh, Edmodo. <clears throat> but this year, we did say, you know what, we want to get everybody up to speed on Google Apps for Education. So again, Information Literacy Services, um, Paul Lawrence and his group, um, designed a program, it was train the trainer using the CITTs and conducting a variety of different training sessions. We were able to get uh, 700, over 730 teachers trained by December. I don't know what the current number is, but using a combination of train the trainer, online and blended learning opportunities, we were seeing a, a stark improvement uh, in the number of, of teachers that not are just exposed to this, but really have grasped it and are starting to use it um, day in and day out. Um, last year, we also mentioned the Professional Learning a Academy concept, where um, with certain kinds of training opportunities, teachers could earn certification points by taking up to a, a five-hour um, class involved with technology, but then they can continue to earn certification points by going back to their schools in and providing support or doing additional training back at their home school. So we have launched that. We've done a couple of classes, and we're very excited about where that's going to take us this year and next as well. At this point, um, we're at question 62 in the survey. And they've gotten through the bulk of it. And they ask us a series of questions that they say um, they're not going to score us, but they may use them for tiebreakers. So I don't know if we got into a tiebreaker situation or not. But so they give us a list of about 20 things, and I didn't list them all. But they said, what are our top IT system priorities? And these are the things that we discussed and came up with. And it's very hard to say what's the number one thing, because they really do go hand in hand. We know that professional development is important. We know that content and curriculum is important. But they, you know, again, you can't train people with professional development. You don't have the content curriculum to give to them and, and vice versa. And of course, you need the data management analytics to determine what it is that you need. We all know that personalized learning is extremely important because everybody has a different learning style. And we know that security is important. So, But these are, again, the things that rose to the top out of the list that they gave us. They also asked us, what makes you most proud when you look at your technology programs? And last year, um, we talked about our rich history and tradition of being a technology leader. You know, we have Promethean and supporting equipment in every single one of our classrooms. We have all these laptops and labs. Um, we have the career academies, um, the morning announcements that are fairly sophisticated that they're doing. Um, the fact that every single one of our teacher has a laptop. You know, now we've got this digital learning program where we're providing a device to, to every student. But the way we answered this question, we mentioned all those things, but we said the things that make us most proud is really when a student, when we see a student contribute and take responsibility of their education. Um, and in the area where we work, we just think that that is just really awesome. It's just when, they, when the students own their own learning. Um, and examples of that was the Student Tech Support Center. You know, when they made that care video, when you see them do the morning announcements um, and the way that they produce those and do those so well, it makes us very proud. 
Um, and then they ask us what has served us well. And it's sort of like a philosophical question. And you know, we do mention, we say every school, every child, every day, whatever it takes. But it's this whole concept of equal access that it's so important that we want to make sure that we provide um, the same opportunities to every student across the division. And that is sort of a bedrock philosophy that I think has served us very well. And of course, the fact that we do have earmarks for technology that our community has decided is important enough to, to make available. And, and of course, we also capitalize on available state and federal subsidies. And so all of those things together help us very much. Coming towards the end here, um, they also ask, if we could receive assistance on any one thing, what would it be? And last year, we said money. You know, we said if um, obviously funding has just been so tight, and it's always tight, funding is always tight, but we gave a different answer this year because again, we were really just thinking about the context of the survey. And we said, you know, it would be really awesome if every single student in Hampton had access to the internet no matter where they were, you know, that they didn't have to be at school. If they had Wi-Fi at home, no matter who they were, where they lived, how really truly awesome that would be. They also ask us, um, what are we doing for the next 12 to 18 months? And again, we have a lot of things going on with professional development and uh, information literacy services. This is a copy from their Cyber Tech Cafe. If you haven't seen that, it's very, very impressive. Lots of training resources available, professional development resources available for teachers. And uh, capitalizing on our bandwidth, you know, we put in pretty big pipes to the school to allow the students to capitalize on that and the teachers to provide those content. And then we mentioned the digital curriculum and OERs and all those different things. And of course, we are looking at um, expanding our Chromebook programs this fall. And they also ask us, you know, what percentage of faculty and staff and students receive laptops, tablets, or smartphones? We actually don't give smartphones to anybody, but um, um, obviously we do quite well with the number of laptops um, and, and iPads, tablets, and so forth that we provide to teachers and students. They also ask us about infrastructure, and again, um, what our strategy, efforts, and accomplishments are. And um, it's one of those things where we're always trying to widen the roads. You know, and I, ho I hope we never get to a situation um, similar to transportation, but um, we, we will always want to make sure that we're trying to provide the best um, experience possible. You know, if you're at school, our hope is is that it's similar, maybe even better than what you would get if you got a high-speed um, premium connection um, through a Cox or a Verizon at home. So we do endeavor to do that. And, uh, and make it available in all areas of school. And we continue to upgrade and expand. We, um, I mentioned to you last year that we had um, a lot of upgrade plans that got delayed because of the E-rate subsidies that didn't come in until actually January. So we only are just now receiving that equipment and we're getting that deployed as we speak as quickly as we can. But, um, but again, that's, that's, it's fairly exciting because we're going to be putting wireless in places that we didn't have it before, even outside around the buildings and some of the athletic facilities and so forth. So again, we're, we're getting there. <clears throat> they also ask us about collaboration. And um, the presentation before is a good segue because uh, we do talk about um, WHRO and EMEDVA, but also Thomas Nelson right, in the dual enrollment program. Um, we also do things with NASA and Google with the Google Palooza events. And uh, of course, we do have the Connect to Compete program with Cox, which offers um, uh, disadvantaged families to get internet access for $10 a month with no long-term um, commitments. We'd still like free. <laughs> um, and then they say, is there anything else that you would like to add in regards to technology? We said, well, you know, actually, we do have this energy conservation program that has saved us $1.7 million a year that's, that relies on technology quite a bit. So we're pretty, pretty happy about that. And then the very last question they asked us is if we're doing anything with the Internet of Things. And um, basically, this is just an industry really kind of buzzword, if you will, that, um, you know, the, the idea is that we're getting to a time when everything's going to be connected to the internet. You know, some people joke, you know, your toaster oven will be connected to the internet at some point. I don't know if that's true, but, but uh, certainly our thermostats and our lighting systems and things like that are a reality today. And some people, you know, if you can program your DVR from your phone and do all kinds of neat things to the internet. Um, 
and they asked us if that was in our strategic plan. And um, actually, we're right in between cycles, and we were mandated by the state to have a technology strategic plan, and we just did an addendum for the state, and it went through flying colors, and it's posted on our website now. Um, but the state said um, they're in the process of revising their plan, and it's not going to be published till 2018. So they asked us to hold off on anything until they get their plan published, because they want us to align with it. So of course we were, and we already have pretty good alignment. I think we're pretty cutting edge in, in a lot of ways with those things as well. And I forgot, I did have one other question I think in here. Yes, and this was the, they asked about the physical redesign of classroom. And uh, you know, we, we do speak to the idea of trying to move away from traditional classrooms toward new higher tech desks and flat panels and modular designs and so forth. But one of our um, goals this year is going to be around charging stations, because with the a number of one-to-one -one devices that we have in our digital learning program, of course, it's important that we provide students an opportunity to get a quick charge if they need one. So in summary, um, I do have a summary slide for you here that just kind of goes over all of those major areas that are in the survey. Um, I do want to thank everybody. Again, this is not just the IT department. I do want to thank uh, everybody that works in the IT department, tech support, the support engineering repair shop networking, but also Paul's group that I've mentioned several times in information literacy services and the CITTs, the curriculum leaders. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, you know, public relations and television and the website support. Of course, the teacher staff and administrators, the students and the parents, the executive team, and you all. I mean, if you, you saw everything up there, this really is everybody here together that's making this happen. So if you haven't heard about it yet, um, again, we were number two last year. We were number three the year before that. And yes, we did get number one this year. <laughs> So with that, is, can I answer any questions? <laughs> that was quite a crescendo there. <laughs> awesome, awesome work. Obviously, um, you en enjoy preparing a PowerPoint because it's very full of uh, all kinds of animation and so forth. Um, but I'll, I'll first defer and, and let our other uh, board members uh, uh, chime in if they have questions. Mr. Kilgore? Uh, wow. Um, that was very impressive. Uh, I know you gave the presentation last year. It's just amazing when you see it all laid out together. Um, we talk about 21st learning in the classroom, but really this, this highlights how we're 21st century at a division level in every respect from governance to the classroom to the administration to human resources. Um, so. I, you know, you had the slide about what makes you most proud. Everything about that presentation makes me proud um, of Hampton City Schools. I think it shows uh, it's an effort that's years in the making. It has to have substantial commitment and investment. Um, and uh, I think other divisions probably look at us and, and just marvel at how much we've done and how how long the road is to get to this point, and I, I can't wait a few years down the road when you're, when you're over there telling us about virtual reality headsets in the classroom <laughs> or something like that, but thank you very much. That was very impressive. Thank you. Mrs. Henry? Yeah, we are proud, and we're glad you're one with the computer, too. <laughs> I remember a, a young John Eagle with a ponytail who was definitely one with a computer all day long. Um, it, it is amazing, and when you say that we're competing with large divisions, this is large. We're not a very large school division, guys. We're a fairly small school division in the scope of things. If you compare us to Chicago or Fairfax County, or you know, we're we're a small little town in Virginia, and it is a, a result of commitment that goes back to your ponytail days when we were putting in uh, different kinds of, of lines and different kinds of routers and different kinds of hubs. And, and as soon as you got one hub in, it was big <laughs> enough and we had to get another one. And uh, it's a long-standing commitment of Hampton City Schools through years and years. And the last few years have been pretty lean and you've had to fight for all those technology dollars. But the, our community, and our parents have told us this at every single
community workshop we've been to since we started having them, one of the top one or two priorities every time was that they wanted our students and our community to have access to the top level of technology. And as Mr. Kilgore pointed out, it is division wide. And so thank you on behalf of the school board to all the division who's, who's contributed to this because it's, it's exciting. Who's next? We're all excited. Anybody down here have okay, a question? I have to say I mean, something. I, thought, yeah. I know. I just <laughs> want to say something. <laughs> they pretty much covered everything, but it's just so exciting. Because as you said, technology is always evolving, and you've got to stay on top of it if you're going to get the most out of it for our, you know, our kids and our families and our staff to take advantage of it. You've got to stay on top of it. And um, it's just really cool to see how you're not just keeping up with it, actually at the cutting edge of it. So. Thank you so much for all your team does and all the hard work. Other questions or comments from board members? For Mr. Eagle, whom we can see right here just this much. Can you turn around for us? Yes, he still has a ponytail. <laughs> the whole time she was saying that, I was like, he there still a, has one of those. There was a time when he wasn't as Thank you for indulging me that. with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we are, I think, as a school board, certainly very, very proud of the work that you all have done on behalf of the division and, um, and particularly the, the work that uh, is going on in the classroom setting. Um, for, a, for a long, long time, we've had board docs, and now we just sort of take it for granted. But, um, um, it, you know, there are lots of school boards that don't have that. In fact, I was uh, talking last night with a former school board member who said, yeah, I was a board remember in the days when we had the big notebooks and we just turned the pages and he loves that we have a computer and it, it, it is very convenient and we, we do have great access to our policies and everything uh, in between. Um, and I know when we, we first launched the use of Promethean boards, that, w I mean, it was like dragging a, you know, a boulder along to get people to buy into that idea. And now that's you know, that's just part of the culture here. Um, so it's, that's really, you know, I, I think um, today we're, we're on the cusp of our one-to-one -one initiative and really uh, getting that fully immersed in our division or getting our division fully immersed in the use of, of the computers in the classroom. And I, I think it's going to be where we are now with the Promethean board as, a, you know, it's just an everyday <coughs> and those things do, um, take time, it takes time to catch on. But I think, um, you know, all the access that we have and all the variety of programming that you've described tonight is just incredible. Um, I knew about a lot of those things, but then you kept naming them. I was, kept writing them down because I was like, i got to check that one out. So um, anyway, it was a super, super report. I'm, uh, and I also love the idea of the charging stations. That's that's. Um, I think that's going to be a great enhancement. Um, uh, so kudos to everything that you, you gave in the report and awesome that, that uh, technology is being acknowledged on a national level and, um, and so we're very excited for that recognition. Uh, that's, that's just awesome. One question. On the parent portal, um, for example, I uh, am a parent and I receive Parent Portal emails. And so I don't go into Parent Portal on a weekly basis because I'm getting those emails with the full list of everything that's going on. And then I forward the email to my daughter in the class where I think she needs to tweak it a little bit. Um, but I, you mentioned the um, the number of parents that are logging in, and so I was wondering if uh, if that is being captured. Uh, you know what I'm saying in the numbers of right. And I don't know, but I'm going to get the answer for you. Okay, I just just clicked with something. me when you were talking about it's a good the question. percentage I thought of, of, that. of people yeah. using it. So I mean, there might be a lot of people that are using it that we don't, we don't mm -hmm. have it captured in that number. Sure, sure. Um, because it's so very convenient to just receive every Monday, I get that little set of emails. It's, you know, eight different emails from all the, the classes. And um, so I just wondered if that was being captured because I don't 
as a result of that, I don't log on and, and go in there because I'm getting all, everything I want right there, which is great. I love that part, and it's convenient. I think other parents are using it that way, too. Um, so just a, just, just a little question for maybe that might be another number to capture. Or we may be already catching it, I don't know. Um, but anyway, obviously, I was really liked that report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John Eagle. <laughs> Dr. Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, with Mr. John Eagle's report, that basically concludes the uh, superintendent's uh, area in terms of um, staff reports. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, we come to the, to the portion in our meeting where we um, will accept uh, a hearing of any delegations or presentation of any written communications or petitions. I don't have any forms. Ms. Bowers, are there any? No, ma'am. So we will move along to our items for action. And um, we have three items uh, for action. Um, first of which is our superintendent's 2016-17 proposed budget. Um, and I will just make a couple of comments about the budget. Actually, it's a whole page, but it'll go quickly, I promise. <laughs> um, obviously, the division leadership team and uh, finance department started their budget preparation work in, in the fall of 2015. Um, the school board received its first formal briefing from the governor's budget uh, at its January 20th meeting. Uh, and the budget uh, decision process that, that uh, you all were going to use in preparing the budget. Um, Finance continued with its work of balancing the budget. Uh, we received stakeholder input uh, during the month of uh, January and February. Uh, the board and, um, and division leadership and finance team had uh, two by two meetings uh, during the latter part of February uh, leading up to, the, to where we are now. Uh, we had conversations and briefings to individual city council members and uh, that was done during the month of uh, early part of March. Um, the school board received an initial proposal of funds 5160, 65, and 94 on March 2nd. Uh, the initial superintendent's fund 50 budget um, was presented to the school board on March 9th, at which time there was a budget gap of uh, just over a million dollars. The Virginia General Assembly session ended on March 12th, and budget conferees completed their work shortly after that. As a result, uh, in an uptick in real estate assessments, uh, we gained uh, $359,000 uh, in local funding, uh, or a little above that. And when the General Assembly's budget was complete, uh, our budget made additional gains in funding as a result of increased flexibility. Uh, in the governor's proposed 18 SOQ positions and changes in per pupil funding uh, from the lottery funds as well as per pupil funding from the Virginia Preschool Initiative. Um, after additional adjustments that were made at the finance level, we were presented a fully balanced budget last week uh, uh, March 20, at our March 23rd meeting. Uh, the school board held budget hearings on the 16th and 23rd and will vote to approve the superintendent's proposed budget in just a minute. Um, with the exception of the desire to restore funding to uh, our supplement pay for coaching and uh, other extracurricular curricular activity sponsors and teachers, this budget does capture most of what the board held as, uh, as priorities. And we are uh, extremely pleased that this budget includes a minimum 3% raise for employees. We acknowledge that uh, this year's increase is the beginning of our fiscal recovery and that salaries in many areas of this division uh, remain below market rates. As we await the results of the compensation study that is underway, uh, division leadership will begin to look at ways to implement increases on a gradual basis as funding allows. And so at this time, I will accept a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the superintendent's proposed budget for FY 2016-17. Second. This has been moved by Mrs. Henry and seconded by Mr. Kilgore that we approve the <coughs> superintendent's 2016-17 proposed budget. Is there any discussion? 
we're all just happy like you, Ms. Mugler. <laughs> happy is good. Happy is good. If there is no discussion, Ms. Bowers, will you call the vote? Mr. Kilgore? Yes, as a member of the school board of the city of Hampton, Virginia, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the adoption of the 2016-2017 school operating budget because my wife is an employee of Hampton City Schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the vote on the budget fairly, objectively, and in the public's interest. My vote is aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Ms. Muggler? Aye. Motion carries. We have a budget. We do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on in our actions, uh, items for action, we have the 2016-2017 Perkins plan, and we did receive a briefing on that last week. Um, is there a motion with respect to uh, approving the Perkins plan? Madam Chair, move approval of action item 6.02. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Kilgore and seconded by Mrs. Henry that we approve the 2016-2017 uh, Carl Perkins plan. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call the vote? Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Ms. Mugler? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, the final item on our action agenda tonight is the VSBA honor roll. And um, I did not ask anyone to read this beforehand, so I'll, I will read it since I didn't, I don't want to put anyone else on the spot. Uh, 2016 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll, whereas public schools and local businesses are an integral part of this community and whereas many local businesses play a crucial role in supporting our schools and whereas the economic health of our community, state, and nation depends on a strong public school system and whereas Collaboration between local public schools and local businesses strengthens schools and the business community alike by providing a well-trained and highly educated workforce. And whereas an excellent public school system is vital to the quality of life in the community and fundamental to preserving strong democratic society now and in the future, therefore, be it resolved that the Hampton School Board names Crown Plaza, Hampton Marina Hotel, Huntington Ingalls Industries and Q Design PLC to the Virginia School Boards Association Honor Roll, showing appreciation for the firm's ongoing support of the community's public schools. Your work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools we can for every child who attends them. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, move approval. Second. It has been moved by Mr. Kilgore and seconded by Mrs. Mr. Samuels that we approve the VSBA honor roll. Is there any discussion? There being none, Ms. Bowers, will you call the vote? Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Harper? Aye. Ms. Henry? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Ms. Muggler? Aye. Motion carries. That concludes our items for action, and we'll move on to our items for information. The next regular meeting of the Hampton School Board will be held on April 20th at 6.30 p.m. in the Rupert Sargent Building, 1 Franklin Street. Um, the School Board and City Council will meet in a joint meeting on April 13th at 11 a.m. in the Hampton Veterans Conference Room at the Rupert Sargent Building, 1 Franklin Street. And um, before I ask you for any sure. informational items, Dr. Smith, we, we want to let everyone else in on the secret. It's not really a secret, but it is Dr. Smith's birthday today. Oh. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and so we have some folks coming in with 
<laughs> a little something to acknowledge the day. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, right. Even though this is on television, we are not going to tell his wife that he's having something That's sweet right. before he gets home tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, would you all like to join me in singing to Dr. Uh. Smith? Don't make me sing alone. So, join me, please. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Dr. Smith. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Delighted to celebrate it with you as well. <laughs> well, there are a lot of other things you could be doing, but we're, we're glad that you shared a little of your time with I us did. today. Well, well, with an adopted yeah. budget or improved budget, what better way to celebrate? <laughs> That's a good Thank you. A good note. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Susie did suggest you might blow that out so we don't there burn we the house down. It might be against the rule, <laughs> I'm not right. sure. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Smith, do you have any other informational items? Uh, no further business from the superintendent, okay. so thank you. <laughs> uh, are there informational items from other board members? Mrs. Henry? Uh, I don't know if any of you were out and about on Monday evening, but City Hall was blue. Mm -hmm. And City Hall was blue because April is uh, child abuse, prevent child abuse month. Now we can't abuse our children as <laughs> much as we're thinking we're not going to abuse you today. Uh, it is prevent child abuse month in April and the City Hall was the site of a kickoff from the Exchange Club and many organizations that support that cause. Um, if you look around town beginning on April 1st, you will see some planting of pinwheel gardens, uh, both by the Exchange Club and a number of the churches in town. The United Methodist churches are doing this as well. Uh, there's a church on Mercury Boulevard that historically has had a large pinwheel garden. The healthy families will be doing pinwheel gardens at social services, at healthy families, and at the Carousel Park. Yeah. And the Virginia Air and Space Museum will be blue and the sales, there's also going to be a garden and blue sales at the Hampton Convention Center. Um, if you're interested in supporting this project or if you're just a parent who's a little frustrated with your own child, remember that Healthy Families in Hampton is a source for parent education and parent support and one of the great strengths of our local government and you can find out about Healthy Families by looking on the Healthy Families website. Uh, which you can find through Hampton.gov. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Henry. Other items for information from board members? Yes. <laughs> ah, OK. Sierra. Well, first we want to say on behalf of, our of your student representatives, have a great spring break to all of our students. But also, we want you to, over the break, register for Walk Hampton Clean. Um, it is going to be held April 22nd through the 23rd, and you can register on the City of Hampton's website. So we want to continue to keep our community clean, so come on and help. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Spring break. You have spring break. That's right. Okay. <laughs> you counting down the days? <laughs> if there's no further business to come before this uh, board, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>